Hello, everybody, and this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very, 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 very special guest. It is Omar Chima, and he is an amazing gentleman. He works with um, the IT industry, but yet he is a life coach, and he has seen and worked with many people from all over the industry and different areas of the workforces. Um, so he has a lot of knowledge in helping people finding their frequencies and adjusting to their stress levels to improve their, themselves in the workforce. And today he's here to share with you different things that he has available and that he's recognized in his own life and in the lives of others who he coaches on different coping mechanisms to help you deal with stress in the workforce. Now, Omar, this is a great honor to have you on the show. I'm very excited to have you on the show. Tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Hi, Stacey. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I love your podcast. Uh, yeah, a little bit about myself. I am, I wear two hats in the context of work. I am a software consultant. Uh, I have my own small consultancy um, that I'm expanding at the minute with uh, a friend of mine or a colleague of mine. But on the other side of it, I'm also uh, a qualified transformational life coach with a specialism in helping men specifically between the ages of 35, 45, to find fulfillment and power within their careers uh, or through their careers, I should say. And um, it's a very, although the two things seem very extremely uh, opposed to each other, they yeah. actually have a common thread. Uh, and the common thread is that throughout my work experience, I've worked in a couple of different industries. So I've been worked in sales and customer service, uh, and over the last 12, 13 years, I've been working as a software testing consultant. And um, the common thread be between my career and what I do as a, as a life coach is it's all about collaboration. The secret to my success, if you will, or the key to my success is collaborating with other people. And one of the key things that I found in my career and one of the key things that I found in conversation with many people, not just my coaching clients, but my um, software clients and my colleagues that I work with is people respond to your energy. People respond to your attitude first mm -hmm. and foremost. If you're going to be quite shy and sit in the corner, corner, even the liveliest, most charismatic person in the world is going to struggle making that connection with you. On the flip side of it, if you're bombastic over the top and you're coming in with all guns blazing, that can be really challenging for yeah. people as well so collaboration requires regulation and modulation of who you are and the ultimate goal of collaboration whether it is you know with friends or family or with your co-workers is that you're working towards an end goal whether it's a project or your company is launching a new product or you're going through a rebranding of your marketing there is an end goal and you're working together to get to that end goal that requires you working in your own capacity in whatever your role is, but it also requires you to learn about your colleagues, learn about what they do, learn about how your role impacts them and vice versa, and how together you move forward to complete a project or a goal. And I'm all about two things. Anybody who knows me knows I'm really about two things. Number one is collaboration. Number two is empowerment. And I think one of the most important things that we can do in this day and age is encourage each other, empower each other through our words, but more importantly, our actions. However, we don't live in an ideal world. You know, we all come across situations that we wouldn't like to be in. We all come across, I mean, I always say that no job is perfect. Yeah. Even the best job in the world has parts of it that you just don't want to do. For me, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. I spend a huge amount of time in meetings and I know people can have mixed feelings. I certainly do. I mean, it's great to collaborate and work with people and talk to people and get to know them, especially when things are moving in the right direction. But then on the flip side of it, you can be stuck in meetings all day and it can be the most unproductive day of your life because nothing's really got done. We've kind of rehashed the old things. We've gone over the same things 10 times and we haven't moved forward. And regulating your own stress levels in that situation is 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 really important to make sure that you don't lose, just lose the, the ability to function and come back the next day and work to the best of your ability. So 
Uh, there's a huge amount of information I've thrown at you. I think for a lot of people, they will be connecting with some of it. I hope all of it. But the, the key thing is here, I really want to talk about stress. Now, in the title of what I've talked about, we, we mentioned frequencies, but I just wanted to go back to a point. Uh, we're not talking here about actual frequencies in terms of brain waves like alpha and beta and theta patterns, which I'm not a neuroscientist. I can't talk to those kind of things. I know there's a huge, um, a huge amount of information around there. Now people do have a lot of awareness, but what I'm talking about here is more of a metaphorical frequency, a frequency of your own stress. And if you imagine that your stress is like um, an old school hi-fi or a, or a radio deck or a boom box with the manual circular dial, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about here. It's a frequency from zero to one, where zero is laid back and not worried about anything, not stressed about anything, and 10 is full on panic mode. And yeah. In both of those cases, both extremes are not really functioning the way mm -hmm. that you should. So people tend to have a tendency to want to be at a five where they're perfectly attuned. Mm -hmm. However, that's not possible because situ every situation is different. Every situation that you face in your working career, every meeting, every interaction, every presentation is completely different. And there's a gazillion factors that will impact how you feel about those. But there are a few things, a few tools that I use, and certainly I, I help in, uh, with my mentoring and my coaching uh, that I think would be really useful. And I'll, I can talk about those in a minute, and can, unless you've got anything that you want to know a little bit more about. No, I think it's really good if we go right into the different um, steps of handling stress in the workforce. This is something that's so prevalent in our society. Every day you hear people, you know, talking about, how they've interacted with all different types of personalities during the, day, during the day, especially when you work in a department or you're working with, you know, it doesn't even have to be a large company. It could be a small or medium-sized company. When you're interacting with different people with different personalities and everybody works differently, you know, everything has to be handled differently. And there are going to be times where, you know, the communication is, is, is well, and there's going to be times where things aren't going perfectly, or you have, you know, certain deadlines you have to make and people can get very stressed out. And when they're not communicating well, you know, the, the job isn't going to get done well. And people have to learn how to take a step back and, and learn how to keep their, their stress level to a certain point and learn the best ways to communicate with others, even if their personalities are completely different. So I would love to get into some of the different coping mechanisms that you've developed over the course of the years that you feel are very beneficial in the workforce. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think everything you've said is absolutely right about our current society. I mean, we work, we get told to be kind, which is brilliant. We get told to be nice and collaborative and supportive. However, the reality isn't always like that. You know, what we're putting on on our sort of corporate posters and what we're putting in our, you know, corporate blogs and things like that doesn't always reflect the day to day of the, what people are going through and, and it can and it can be a real challenging situation where you've got a lot to do you've got a number of things on your own to-do list but then you need to support and manage other people and collaborate with other people juggling all of that can be can be really difficult it can be a minefield some would yeah. say but i think one of the key things to remember is that everybody is different and you have certain traits or certain um, default positions. I'm not going to talk about personalities, but I would say there are within a working environment, people default to certain positions and they are either a position of power mm -hmm. or, or in the workforce, that's usually hierarchical, authoritative power. Mm -hmm. There are those people who are far more comfortable just being in the background, being completely invisible, being left alone. There are those who are kind of comfortable in the spotlight even though they don't really have any authority they you know they're happy to take the attention even yeah. if it is you know at, at the you know sometimes self-deprecating uh, attention and there are and, and that's the spectrum and we've got people all along that and people can vary where they are on that spectrum but those default positions it's really stressful and often very difficult to step out of those default positions if you're you know i work in the it industry i work with a lot of talented programmers 
who will can spend all day with their eyes on a screen, headphones on, and they work perfectly well. But as soon as you pull them into a meeting, they can get really flustered. They can really get confused about what's going on. They're out of their comfort zone. Uh, and that's what we want to talk about here. If you want to progress in your career, certainly what I help my uh, coaching clients with is that there's a certain level of discomfort that you have to get comfortable with. And yeah. that means stepping out of your your comfort zone, stepping out of your default role into something different. Now, I've worked with people on both ends of the spectrum. I've worked with people who are on that dial who are eight or nine and are able to function really well. But yeah. that level of energy can be really, really off-putting, can be really distracting, and sometimes can really derail a program or a project of work that's going on. And on the flip side of it, I've worked with them, you know, some really laid back characters. Um, I would say laid back is nice in theory. <laughs> you know, it might make a, a general working environment quite relaxed when there isn't that much going on. But when yeah. it hits the fan, those laid back people aren't necessarily great at stepping into a more pressurized role or position. Um, so you have to get comfortable in a certain level of dim, dis, discomfort. Right. I would say the first thing is, you know, every scenario is different. Every person is different, every organization, every project. So what we're going to talk about here now is some kind of high level tools that you can use that I've used in my day to day to kind of help me uh, get through things. Uh, and I'll use myself and maybe a couple of my coaching clients as examples. But we've got, if you keep in the back of your mind, we've got a dial. It can either be at zero or it can be in 10, or it can be anything in between, depending on what you need. I know a lot of people out there would be asking, why would I want to keep it at nine? Why would I want to be at eight? Why would I want to be at the higher end of panic and stress? Right. Well, there is a very specific scenario, certainly in the IT industry, where projects <laughs> move at very quick pace, of very tight deadlines. It's great to be relaxed and let everybody chill out and you know be comfortable all the time. But actually what's required, certainly in the last phase of a project, is everybody needs to come together and everybody needs to work collaboratively, but at a, at a, at a fast pace in a high pressure environment. And that's where dialing your personal eight you know stress levels up to eight or nine can actually, excuse me, can actually be really beneficial because other people are feeding off your energy. That's oh, yeah. the key thing. That's why we talk about modulating stress levels is because if I'm if I'm stressed, if I'm you know on edge, people will pick up on that. People mm -hmm. would either respond to it or they will at least acknowledge it or they will at least recognize it. In some cases, that can be used against you. Some people can take advantage of your panic. They can take advantage uh, of your completely relaxed state as well. So we don't want people to take advantage of ourselves. We want people to respond and match our energy levels as appropriate. And that's the main reason I really encourage people to, to regulate that. So we talked about why we want to do it. How do we do it? Again, it's different for everybody. And it depends where you naturally fall on that dial. You know, some people are naturally at an eight or a nine. Some people are naturally at a one. So you need to make sure that what you're doing is right for you and try to consider that this isn't something that you need to use every single meeting or every single interaction. You can be chilled out sometimes if that's your natural position. You're, you're, you know, you can do that 50, 60% of the time. If you're a high in, high intensity person, you can be like that 60, 70% of the time, but you must be aware of how your energy levels, how your attitude, how your frequency is affecting those around you and is it beneficial to the collaboration is it beneficial to getting us to the end of the project is it better beneficial to get the brand out there to be in line with whatever we need to do um so if i can jump in with a few key things some of them probably like i said your your listeners are well versed in a lot of this already uh, you know you've had some amazing guests on here and i know a lot of them have probably touched on a lot of these already so I think for me, though, where I like to start is with my appearance. Mm -hmm. It seems like a really superficial thing, but actually it's not about, you know, being in shirt and tie every single day. It's not about coming in with, you know, sparkly, shiny shoes. Mm -hmm. The reason why your appearance is important. I mean, first of all, I think being sensibly well-groomed. Now, I have a beard. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I try to keep it trim. I try to keep it tidy because 
I take not only do I take care of my appearance, it reflects that, you know, I I, I take a little thing seriously. You know, mm-hmm. I, I care about my appearance because I want you to care about not necessarily how good looking I am or anything like that. But if you if I come in and I'm more scruffy than I am right now, then how much confidence will you have in my capability to get right. anything? So if I can manage the little things, that adds to it. But there are, but I would say the key things match match your peers, you know, and I think that's true in many situations, but I think with your dress sense, depending on the type of organization there is, there might be a dress code, there might be a uniform. Obviously, if that's the case, you've got to wear a uniform, there's a specific dress code, keep yourself well-groomed, keep your shirts, keep your blouses, keep everything well ironed, tight, uh, neat, tidy. But if you're working in an environment where people are wearing t-shirts and hoodies, where, you know, I've worked in a lot of IT organizations where they have no dress code, mm-hmm. and, that, and that's great, match that. You know, because you're on the same level, you're collaborating. You're not, uh, you know, if somebody's wearing a, sh- a T-shirt and shorts and I show up in a tie, shirt and tie deliberately, that's going to unbalance things a little bit. So mm-hmm. your appearance matters, but it's not about being a supermodel. You know, it's right. about matching the, uh, the the sort of what your peers are doing. In specific situations, negotiations, interviews, uh, which is a form of negotiation, by the way, Dressing formal is a power move, and it's really critical that you do that. Mm-hmm. There are other environments. If you're showing up to casual Fridays, you should show up casual. You should show mm-hmm. up in your Hawaiian shirt and your and your flip flops because that's <laughs> what everybody else is doing. And and that specific scenario is designed to relax everyone. So right. you don't want to show up in a suit when everybody else is in Hawaiian shirts. So right. it makes you feel a little bit uneasy. And again, people are going to be matching your energy. They're going to feeding off your stress levels so dial it down when you need to dial it up when you need to that's the first thing that you can dial up the dial down the other thing is it's probably really obvious but your bodily functions you know mm-hmm. do you need to be um can be a real <laughs> can can re- can throw a real spanner in the works if i can use that expression because mm-hmm. i've been on calls myself where i've had to jump from call to call to call i've not had a chance for a toilet break in between and on a call where it's supposed to be quite relaxed and a bit sort of uh, reflective of what we're doing, I'm coming across with all this nervous energy because I've not had a chance to go pee, you know? So be aware of that kind of stuff. You know, those little things about your, your yourself can, only you can tell what's gonna go on. Only you can right. tell how your bodily functions are gonna invite you. And it's not just about needing the bathroom. Like I'm sure we've all had a day when we're not feeling too well in ourselves and we're feeling maybe a bit lethargic, maybe feeling a bit run down. Yeah. You might not be able to change that about yourself, but you can be aware of it and you can try to rise above that. You know, I've right. worked with some, um, it, it, I mean, it hasn't happened for a long time, but I worked with a colleague who was super ill, but he was of, he was 60s or 70s. And he was of that old school mentality where you show up to work every day, and you give it your, give it your all. Mm-hmm. But in between meetings, he was just going to the bathroom and being sick. You know, that's, that's you know that's really great and really brave but that doesn't that kind of mentality doesn't work anymore now yeah you know people are seeing him throw up makes me feel sick makes yeah. me feel like i might be getting unwell so be aware of how your what your body is telling you in terms of just your basic bodily functions yeah um and i think that also includes hunger and, and mm-hmm. food you know again just like being ill can make you a bit sloth like being full can make you a bit sloth like Right. At the same time, you know, being overly hungry can, again, put you on edge and it can, you don't want to be too hungry. You don't want to be full. You want to be in that kind of, that's probably one of those few places where a happy medium is probably consistently the best thing to be. Um, right. But I find that, again, depending on the situation, I will skip out on food and have maybe an extra, or maybe two extra cups of coffee because I need that pep. I need that energy and I need that kind of, the uh, that kind of a, anxiousness almost to kind of make me get through some of the tougher challenges of the day where I know I need to be setting the energy level for the next week yeah. because we've got a, I, we've got a really important target to meet and we need to be working we need to be aware that there's a lot of pressure on us we need to be working at pace but we also be we also need to be able to just you know really drive drive the momentum uh, uh, and that's what that's 
that's what you know sometimes you you hear about these um ceos things like that who survive on like 18 cups of coffee a day and mm -hmm. things like that uh i mean i'm not i'm not for a moment promoting that as a as a yeah. way to be all the time but there are times where skipping a meal having an extra cup of coffee using the hunger to your advantage to dial up the sort of uh, the the pressure on yourself right to the point that you can manage it but obviously if the hunger is impacting you go get a snack go get a bite to eat but at the same time I mean, during the day i mean if i have lunch which i very rarely do these days i have a very very small lunch it's usually just a, a boiled egg just mm -hmm. to just to i'll stop feeling hungry but i'm not i'm not full i've still got the kind of that hunger to drive me forward right. so yeah so just like your your body can tell you about you know needing to pee and you know putting you in an anxious state or a relaxed state yeah. we all know how it feels to be relaxed after a, a toilet break hunger can have a similar impact and that can help you modulate your 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 energy levels and your stress levels in that in that moment i think probably one of the the uh the biggest um marketing campaigns i've seen ab around stress these days has been around breathing techniques yoga obviously meditation and multiple things but also sort of things delinked from yoga and meditation is just general breathing techniques and there's a number of different techniques out there uh, uh my go-to is three three six so three breath in for the count of three out for the count of six mm -hmm. that's a really really good technique for me personally especially when i know i'm about to go into a stressful situation right. so it's something that i can use just before uh, or something that can use during stressful or uh, particularly challenging meeting. And those are, it's very quick. That's the first mm -hmm. thing. Even on a live call, it's its hardly noticeable. Um, for me, just an addition on top of that ratio of breathing is that I always, when I breathe in, my belly goes out. Mm -hmm. And when I breathe out, my belly goes in. Uh, sometimes people have it the other way and that's fine, but it's just, it's the technique of, Three in, the, three in, six out. In for the count of three, out for the count of six. And that helps to bring your heart rate down. It helps to bring your cortisol levels down. Right. It helps to kind of bring you to a, a more stable level. And it's something that you can do in the middle of a conversation. And actually, I've used that in particularly challenging situations where people have addressed me head on, uh, mm -hmm. asked me a question, and just three, six, three, six, a couple of times, not only does it give my heart rate a chance to settle, but it also gives me a chance to think. Yes. And my answer can be a lot more uh, focused and formulated, well-constructed, and can really, really end the challenge there and then, rather than waffling or trying to speak within one breath or get everything going. Take a breath, literally. Give yourself time to think uh, and that moves on to the next one is i find in some situations that silence is really really important it's really really good not just to allow me to breathe but time to think we all work in really fast-paced organizations today and one of the key things that we're missing from our sort of productivity from our capabilities and our, that impacts our productivity is thinking time we're on the go, you know, you, you know, you can be getting calls before you've even got out of bed in the morning. You can yeah. you can be checking your emails while you're while you're on the toilet. There's there's no break from work, right. which means there isn't really any chance to stop and think. So make sure that you carve some time into your day, whether it's blocking it out in your calendar or whether you go on your lunch and you go for a walk, that you absolutely must have thinking time. You must have silent time where it's just you or even if it's not just you you can be in a room full of other people as long yeah. as we're all agree to be silent right it's time this is our time to think think about what's going to happen what we need to do our to-do list but it's also really important that we reflect on the things that went well and more importantly what didn't go well right so thinking time needs to be in your calendar on a daily basis it needs to be something that you carve out regularly and it's something that you need to protect fiercely because so much of the value and the quality of your work will depend on how well you can think about, plan, project, all those kind of things. You need the brain power to do it and you need to be able to do that in a fairly isolated, uh, isolated manner.
Um, and then there's a few other things that I like to throw into the mix because I'm a fun guy. I like to mm -hmm. use music uh, as part of my sort of da daily routines, but also yeah. in very specific circumstances. If we think about how much of a part music plays in our lives, you know, you, any dining experience, you think about the music, you know, your, your, your intimate time with, with right. your partner, music. You're going out with the kids, you're watching a movie, you are go to the gym, music, music, music. Right. But how many of us are utilizing music as part of our day-to-day -day stress management? Right. You can listen to music at any time. A lot of us can have it on in the background because we don't have client-facing roles. Some of us are more constricted. You know, we don't, we can spend a lot of time in, in calls and things like that. Mm -hmm. But having out a little bit of time to listen to your favorite song is good. But you need to be aware also of the type of music you're listening to. If right. you're listening to like sad heartbreak songs, great. That might help you get over a heartbreak, but it's not mm -hmm. going to put you in the right mood for your right. meeting. Uh, but at the same time, you know, listening to speed metal might also not be the right move for you. You need to figure out what works for you. Right. Something I like to do. Uh, I don't know if anybody else does this. I've never discussed it with anything else, but I know if I'm going into a particularly challenging meeting, like I said, I show up early. I always show up with a smile on my face. And sometimes that's really easy for me to do if I watch a little bit of stand-up beforehand. Just right. five minutes. It's something that I really enjoy that I know is going to make me laugh. It's yeah. really going to help bring my stress levels down. It's really going to put a, a genuine smile on my face. And I can carry that energy in. And then from that point, it's easier then. Okay, so this is a meeting where I need to be relaxed. I can keep smiling, but stay mm -hmm. silent. This is a meeting that requires bit more energy it requires me to put a few people on the spot or scrutinize my work or other people's work right yeah you know, i can dial it down but the more you do it the more you practice regulating and modulating your stress levels the better you'll get at it and mm -hmm. there'll be you'll be able to do that pretty soon without having to depend on you know certain types of food certain types of music certain types of activities but the key thing is that you find a myriad of tools that you can juggle and that you can use and that you can find to fit your specific situation. But the key thing is, is that you are in charge of your own stress levels. Yes, mm -hmm. you can get a huge amount of um, pushback from other people. You can get a great deal of challenge. You can get a lot of stress put upon you, but you right. do have a choice within that, how you handle that, how you react to that. And there are a few practical things that you can do. Change your environment, change your mood, change your situation, change your music, change your clothes. Right. All of these things will help to regulate and modulate your your stress levels for better collaboration. I think those are great um, resources of advice. I, you know, a lot of times too, I see also is that people have a hard time communicating when they, and sometimes they mean well, but their tone or the words they use in their sentences or, you know, um, can play a big factor on how the other person interprets it. And, yeah. um, you know, when it comes to communication, are there some tips that you could probably give people? Because I've been in, in meetings with people and I know them well. So I know that they're, they're not trying to come across a certain way, but by their tone or by some of the words they're using, or even if they are a high strung type person, that high strung energy is making everybody else high strung and they don't mean to make everyone high strung. It's just their personality. So, yeah. you know, what are some suggestions for people, you know, if they want to really, you know, do well in, in the business world and communicate well with their peers, um, some, maybe some tactics, you know, or some things they could do to try to change their communication skills so they can improve it when they're around other people. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I've got one word that will sum it all up, but it's easier said than done, and that's empathy. Mm -hmm. If you can empathize with the person or the people that you're talking to, that will massively level the playing field, not just in terms of giving you an advantage in, into knowing them better, but also helping them to feel understood. Because somebody can spend all day long explaining something to you, but they can't understand it for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so empathy is the great leveler. It's the thing that kind of um, allows for great communication, for great collaboration. 
But like I said, it's easier said than done. Some people are very naturally empathetic to the to the point where they almost feel psychic. <laughs> Some people are so oblivious of their own feelings and their own mental states that they are it's hard to empathize with them because it, you can't get into somebody else's head when they don't know what's going on in, in their own. Yeah. So empathy is, I would say, a key thing that you need to work on. But I do believe it's a skill that I mean, it's something that I have cultivated and learned to sort of get better at over years. I haven't met anybody I would say is a master, but I would say anybody who's good at being empathetic is something that they're always working on. It's always trying to understand the other person's point of view. What that what that does in my experience, or what that has done for me, is that there have been times where I, uh, I I've been a late bloomer. You know, I, I was working at the sort of the bottom rungs of an organization all through my twenties. It wasn't until I was married, had a couple of children, that I fell into or came across the world of software testing. And at that point, I was working with people 10, 12, 13 years younger than me. And I, I got treated like somebody who was fresh out of university, although I had this huge wealth of mm. experience behind me. Yes. And a lot of the times I was dealing with people my age or even younger who would speak down to me. I know they didn't mean to. And I know they didn't really have the communication skills coming from very technical backgrounds yeah. to know how to talk to me in a way that didn't come across patronizing. Mm -hmm. But what I was able to do differently to my sort of younger colleagues was I was able to empathize all right this guy is dealing with a lot he's very stressed he does he's not used to giving somebody instructions right so I can understand how that comes across so if you can practice empathy if there is such a thing um, mm -hmm. some people are like I said naturally good at it but empathy will be the key to unlock great collaboration as well as sort of you know how you see other people it will impact how people see you as well. If you can em empathize with somebody who's just puffing and puffing and, you know, blowing yeah. out steam out of his ears, you know, the old sort of cartoon with the red face and the steam coming out of his ears. If you can empathize with that person, hey, wow, you must be really stressed. I can see that you've got a lot on your plate at the minute. Thanks for giving me that information, even though it you know, can come across as really, really, really harsh criticism. Mm -hmm. take a moment to appreciate it and say one of the, I mean the reason I say that is because one of the things that I struggled with in my career because of my age people thought I knew a lot I really found it difficult to get honest feedback out of people mm -hmm. but the only people who gave me honest feed feedback were the the aggressive ones the ones who are like ah oh, this is terrible work great okay what was I doing wrong so take the feedback Always try and put a positive spin on it. Always easier said than done. But the main thing is if you can empathize with the person who is challenging you, yes, you will find that you not only improve things for yourself, but you'll also improve things for them, which can have a massive impact on the rest of the team as well. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. You know, I think I think sometimes people um, lack empathy and sometimes they have to like maybe, you know, put themselves for a second in the other person's shoes and say, you know, how would I feel if I was going through there? Or even better, if you did go through something in life similar, you know, go back and, and recollect in your brain, how did that make me feel when I was going through that? And then try to have some empathy for that individual, you know, and, you know, and then I think, like you said, empathy is really important because I think a lot of times I've come across people where they lack empathy. And that's where I think the communication barrier is, is when people lack empathy and they can't relate to the other person, you know, um, that's when the problem begins because you don't have to go through what that person has been through to emphasize with them. You could just think, if I went through that, how would that make me feel? And then I would think about that for a second. And then I would be able to communicate better with that individual. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the key. I mean, there is, it's kind of a step before that, if you will. And that is, mm -hmm. again, it's, it's much easier said than done, especially in the sort of the high octane sort of uh, world that we all live in at the moment is try not to take things personally. Yes. Uh, you know, and I, like I said, it's easier said than done. And I've been in situations where um, I haven't really been able to empathize with the person. 
Mm -hmm. because you know it, it's a completely alien situation to me or you know their their approach to things is so completely different to what i'm used to it's really difficult for me to emphasize uh, empathize with that person the best i can do in that situation is not take it personally you know right he's coming screaming and shouting um and unless i know with 100 percent certainty that i have done something wrong or i have made a mistake and i've tried to hide it um it's not really directed at me, you know, as we say, you know, it all rolls downhill, you know, they, yeah. they're probably getting pressure from their boss. It's just in the moment, somebody can say something. And, I, and I've, you know, taken that to the extremes where other people have had to inform me to take things personally, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, you know, you were, in, I was in a meeting with someone and we were talking about how to improve the quality of a particular uh, technical solution. And we were just disagreeing with each other. And he made a few snarky comments in between there to try and undermine me, which, because I'm so used to taking things not personally, I didn't even register them. Mm -hmm. And what happened in that scenario was that actually I came out on top because everybody saw him sort of lower himself in that scenario to yeah. you know, deliberately trying to undermine someone. People mm -hmm. lost trust in him uh, and it kind of snowballed for him after that. But yeah. because I was completely oblivious to it, um, didn't take it personally in any way. I yeah. came out and you know, now people are kind of appreciate the professionalism, they appreciate the fact that I can be uh, calm under that kind of pressure, but also, you know, we can be professional about things. We can disagree with things vehemently about stuff, but that doesn't mean we have to be um, attacking one, one another. We have to be at odds with each other. I've been in situations, many, many situations, and I, and I know from listening to many of your your guests that you've had on as well, they've been in situations where they have been at odds with the people that they have been working with or the people they need to work with. But just because they've been at odds with them doesn't mean that the relationship devolved into anything negative or they were, right. you know, they were at odds with each other as individuals, just their points of view didn't align a particular subject and that's right those are the two main things that i feel that have really really helped uh myself progress you know mm -hmm. in terms of improving communication obviously you need to to, to listen you know the old ad adage about having two ears and one mouth mm -hmm. listen twice as much as you talk yeah great advice you know my grandma told me that when i was a young kid i, I think many people's grandmas gave them the same advice mm -hmm. and it's good advice but there are times when, uh, you know, you have to speak up, you have to talk, you have to be heard. And in that moment, I would default again to a less is more kind of situation. Yes, I've got something really important to say, but I don't want to bore people with huge and huge amounts of information. Tailoring yeah. what needs to be said to the right audience is a skill. But generally speaking, try and say it in less words and say right. it in as few words as possible um unlike what i've just been doing for the last five minutes <laughs> now if you had to take everything that we talked about today and you wanted to emphasize on some important factors what are some things that you think are important that you want the listeners to understand well um that's that's a very good question um and that's not the kind of question we get asked that often to be honest i think the key points that we've talked about here is that you know collaboration will be the key to your success we live in a world where you know we all hear the term that we're hyper connected these days but hyper connectedness means that we have to be hyper collaborative we have to really really improve our collaboration skills we really really have to be able to listen better we need to be more concise in our communication. Yes. But putting all that aside, the key thing is that first you have to manage yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, and managing in, in this day and age where feelings and how we feel are being talked about more readily, more in the open, we have to be aware that sometimes we have to adjust how we feel or we have to maybe put our feelings to a side just for a little bit. Mm -hmm. to focus on the work that needs to be done so modulating your stress levels modulating your mood regulating your your um your energy and your pace and the the level at which you are feeling stressed mm -hmm. is really important and but you have to find those tools that work for you there's a myriad of 
um, tools out there, whether it's, you know, uh, meditation, whether it's something spiritual, whether it's something practical, find what works for you. Mm -hmm. knowing that not everything is going to work a hundred percent of the time there's no foolproof system unfortunately we're gonna feel the stress we're gonna feel low at some point but what's important is that you realize one you're not alone everybody goes through it and two you have the capability within yourself to lift yourself up as well right people should feel empowered with all the knowledge and information out there don't feel like being stressed the the fact that you're stressed right now is the only state that you get to be in. You get to choose and you get to do what's right for you. Yes. I think that's great advice. And I I think people have to realize too, that they're always speaking to people with different personalities and you really yeah. have to try to look at that person and quickly try to analyze what type of person that is. So when you, yeah. do, you know, interact with them and speak to them, like you said, you know, have some empathy and understand where they're coming from, how they think and, and be able to, you know, discuss something and get your point across without hurting the other person's feeling or without stressing them out. And, you know, hopefully, you know, they can do the same when they're, they're speaking with you. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's great advice that you've given. I Thank really you. Am. Now, are there like, what type of services um, do you offer? Cause I know you offer several different services. Can you tell us the services that you offer? Absolutely. So, uh, with my software testing hat on, I have a software testing consultancy and the called Sonata QA quality assurance, uh, another word for testing. What I do and now that I've uh, grown that consultancy a little bit, I'm working with a colleague of mine and we're partnering up to deliver a number of different services. So in the software testing space, we provide uh, project support where we go into your project and working as consultants, we help to improve the quality of that software by working with your developers, we're working with your business teams to find the bugs, find the, the problems and the issues and get them resolved before you launch your product we also do uh some training along there uh, along those lines that's something i personally really enjoy is working with people who are who are new to testing or have been in testing for a while but they want to upskill their their staff or themselves Mm -hmm. uh, to give them the better resources a lot of them a lot of that is uh, based around communications but a lot of the technical and the more um software testing specific skills that you need to be able to uh, improve uh, and progress within that software testing space. And then the last thing that we do, or one of the last things that we do in that space is that we also provide uh, recruitment services for, you know, if you're looking for software testers or looking for anybody in that software testing space, we we act as a recruitment agency, leveraging our knowledge, deep knowledge of software testing to make sure that the right candidates are aligned to the right projects. Uh, and that's Sonata QA. Um, uh, we currently sort of everything sits under the banner of Sonata Plus, mm-hmm. which is um, our new, uh, my sort of my new um, business name, if you will. And that's because everything was moving to Sonata Plus, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus. <laughs> it made sense to to add a plus in there, and that's also because the plus is that I'm not the kind of person that can sit still for too long. I like to be working on new projects uh, and that's why working as a consultant is really good for me because you know i can spend a year with one client and then move on to the next right and next and next and next and i get to learn so many different things but also um the value of that is that we've now got a very very uh deep understanding of testing uh principles that exist across multiple industries um we can leverage that from working in uh you know large scale organizations like airports to to small organizations and startups and things like that. So that's, uh, if you go to sonataplus.com, you'll you'll find a link to all our brands, Sonata QA being for our software testing. On the coaching side, my um, 18 months ago, what I started was called the Provider Program. And that was because I was working specifically with men um, who didn't really think about their careers too much. They just thought about having a job because they need to provide for their families. Mm-hmm. And it was more about just giving them a lot of the skills and the tools that we've talked about today to to sort of clear the fog from, right. from minds and give them a bit of focus. 
I've been working one-to-one -one with a number of different clients over the last 18 months, but now that I'm moving into more of a group coaching session, we're rebranding that. Um, it's The new program is called The 100K Man. And the idea behind that is we want to give men between the ages of 35 to 45 who are kind of at a certain level, you know, middle management, yes. give them the skills to kind of, a lot of the people that I speak, I spoke to, I speak to, they feel trapped yeah. at a certain level. They feel like they've hit the peak. Things aren't going to get any better. Yeah. Uh, the reason I work, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever turn anybody away who came for help. But the reason who, the reason I work with men, uh, predominantly, is because I've been that man. I've been that guy. I've been that. I've been in that situation where I felt like you know I was at a certain level of income, and that's all I was ever going to achieve in my life. And right. The, the aim of this program now is one uh, working alongside other you know people who are being coached at the same time it's a real team spirit it's, it's all about that collaboration and that empowerment like we've been talking about today to help uh, people your peers help you and you help them to uh, improve your communication skills improve your organization skills but improve the concept of career as a journey not as a yes. job so exactly. you know, job is just one stopping point or one break or one stepping stone if you will on the journey of your career right. so the 100k K man is about upskilling men who feel trapped uh, in their roles who are not getting what they want to help them find fulfillment through their careers mm -hmm. to get to that 100k mark and go beyond that right. by giving them the tools that they need to succeed in that role i love it i love it now, where is the best place for people to get a hold of you if they want to work with you, either for either either your software company or for your consultant? Where can they find you? LinkedIn is the best place. Uh, Omar Chima. There is you'll find me because um, although there's many Omar Chimas on LinkedIn, uh, I'm the only one who has encapsulated my entire experience with the caption, biting off more than I can chew since uh -huh. 1980. Uh, because that sums me up really well. I, I like to take things, you know, I like to plunge into things. I like to deep dive into things. And I often do bite off more than I can chew. But, <laughs> um, that's all part of what makes life interesting. I feel. Yes. And I think that, you know, if I can pass on a little bit of my energy and my enthusiasm uh, and my uh, ambition onto other people, then I think I've done something good with my life. And that is the main purpose of what um, what I'm all about, to be honest. The, the two things that we mentioned at, at the start of this was collaboration. Um, you know, we've talked about that, how to collaborate and how to communicate, but also empowerment. You know, I believe, yes. you know, I, I've been on a kind of almost lonely journey over the last 12 years where I've had to really deep dive uh, and spend a lot of time and energy and money on myself to develop myself. But now right. I'm in a position where I can leverage all of that knowledge, experience, uh, all of that information to help empower other people yes. to, to build a life of fulfillment. I and mean, we we live in an age now where, you know, we're constantly being bombarded with images and social media and ideas of side hustles and passive income, yes. uh, these kind of things. And that's brilliant. You know, I'm I'm all for that. But I feel for somebody who's done it, who's transitioned from, you know, a nine to five into building a sort of a, a side hustle or a, or a, a side business. Yes. It's not that easy. And right. the biggest challenge is your mindset shift. Yeah. You know, being an employee or being working in a nine to five or in a, in a role where you get a salary and all those kind of things to then be a hundred different things just to get brand off the ground it's right. a very different transition and yes. for a lot of people it's not always worthwhile i'm not saying that you shouldn't try it and you shouldn't put your effort in but you can refocus that energy back into your career and yes. get the fulfillment that you might get out of a side hustle you can definitely get it out of your career and if you're at that sort of 35 to 45 age range you've got between 15 and 20 years of work experience behind you that you can yes. build on, and you can leverage that to build a life that you want without having to have all the stress of like you know being a ceo or being a marketing expert being a social media expert you know running around working working 100 hours a week focusing all that energy into finding a fulfilling career mm -hmm. is 
probably one of the fastest ways that you can make it to that 100k oh definitely and, and that's what i that's really what i'm about it's about you know you've done the work already you've got 15 20 years of life experience and work experience behind yeah. you now let's leverage that use that to empower yourself to get to the level that you want to in your career yeah i love it this, this has been amazing you know i love having you on the show is there anything else that you might, might want to um any other advice that we haven't gone over that you might want to just uh tell the listeners before we go uh yeah i think the key thing and this is shameless self-promotion here so forgive me uh but if you want to get good at something you need a coach yes. um and even if I'm not the right person for you, if you want to get good at your journey of your career, if you want to get good at collaborating with other people, if you want to improve your communication skills, your management skills, you need to obviously spend that time on yourself. You yeah. need to put the energy into yourself. Mm -hmm. Having a coach makes it a hundred times easier because yeah. not only do you get to benefit from, from somebody's experience and knowledge, but you also get uh, a cheerleader in your corner you also yeah. get somebody to hold you accountable and you get somebody to um push you at a time when it's easy for you to just fall back into your comfort zone so yes if i'm not the right coach for you i guarantee you there is somebody out there for you so look into a coaching program even if it's not for the whole idea of you know i don't want to i know how to be a good manager i don't need you know somebody to teach me how to be a good manager but I would benefit from somebody telling me how to manage my stress a little bit better. Exactly. Find people and, and leverage their knowledge and experience and the encouragement and the empowerment that you'll get out of working with a coach. Oh, a hundred percent. I think everybody needs a coach to be honest with you. I, I've, uh, I've learned in my own, my own um, experiences that when having, having a coach and some people have more than one coach, there's times where I've had more than one coach for different areas you know, um, having a coach is great because you, they see things from outside the box. They're not biased and they have a lot of great ideas and they, they can guide you along the way. And if you do fall a little bit off track, they're there to push you right back on track. So you, yeah. you could stay on that white line and move forward and elevate and get to that point where you want to be in life. So yes, I agree with you hundred percent. Everybody needs a coach in their life. Very true. Very true. Well, this has been amazing, Omar. I, I thank you so much for being on the show. And I thank you for all your valuable uh, information. I hope you'll come back and we can discuss more. We tapped into stress today and we tapped into communication. And I would love for you to come back and maybe we could talk about empowerment because I know you have a lot of information about oh, yeah. you know empowering others and how people can empower themselves. And I'd love to have you back on the show. But this has been amazing. You provided us with such valuable information, information that's well needed, especially in today's society where we lack communication skills. And I think due to all the electronics and due to always being on the phone and on the screen and the lack of communication, because everybody is, you know, you know, having either AI do something for them or having, you know, or just communicating through, you know, a text and not really verbally, you know, you know, talking with people and interacting with people. It's so important to have those communication skills in order to be successful in today's world. So I thank you very much for coming on the show and, and teaching us a little about pleasure. communication and stress, because those are two things in life that we need everything. I think everybody needs a little help. And so thank you. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute honor and I look forward to coming back on the show at some point soon. Yes. Thank you so much. And you have a great day. You too. Thank you very much. Take care.